What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. That is Mr. FB God. That is Mike Me Up on Twitter. Make sure you're following them on Twitter. Make sure you are subscribed to the Bunk Bed Breakdowns YouTube channel. They're doing Dynasty content each and every single day. Not on this channel, on their channel. Linked in the description. Week one, fantasy football is almost in the books. We are like, uh, we're in the fourth quarter. Giants versus Steelers turning into a shit show. We have veins popping out of Snacks' head probably right now. And then we have the Titans, Broncos right after that. We're just going to kind of run through week one. Our takeaways from all the games, some of the big facts that we came away the weekend with um, going forward, maybe some trade targets at the end and dynasty and redraft. And, uh, you know, we'll let, we'll let Noah celebrate probably the only win that the Chargers are going to have on the year. Big Bengals win. Joey Burrow's first uh, first start in the NFL. Sloppy looking, but, hey, a win's a win, right? Yeah, we'll take them however we can get them. It's not going to come very often. No, it won't. No, it won't. All right. Michael, I'm not going to tell you to close Excel again. <laughs> <laughs> Problems. All right. Hit that intro. <laughs> I mean, boys, I don't know about you, but I went through a fucking roller coaster shitstorm of emotions, you know, between between DFS, between fucking all my all my leagues, between the bets I made, fucking losing money on the Panthers because they missed an extra point. Fuck that. Like, dude, I had to like I had to honestly compose myself after week one before recording Market Watch Mondays. So I was just sitting there on my couch, like, holy fuck, man, football's back. Wait, DFS Last shit happened. You? DFJ killed huh? me. David fucking Johnson <laughs> on Thursday night ended me <laughs> before the season even started. Well, yeah, dude, anxiety season is like one. You know, it's really hard. Like, Mike, this is your first season in the in the content business per se, mm -hmm. and the really hard part about football Sundays now is you're literally rooting for everything and against everything at the same time. And it's like you want your fantasy teams to do well. You want your DFS plays to do well. You want all the people that you helped with, like, sit starts to do well. And it, it just can't happen. So one way <laughs> or another, so many negative feelings going into your mind. And it makes me, uh, like, semi-hate football. So football, <laughs> yeah. football's bike, but it's not, a, I'm not, it's not welcomed back into this yeah. fucking headquarters. My yeah, favorite part is telling somebody to start Christian Kirk and then four hours later being like, well, that aged well. I'm like, I'm sorry. I didn't know he was going to catch one pass for zero yards. If I did, I wouldn't yeah, have there are, there are a few, uh, There are a few phrases that are like auto blocks for me on Twitter <laughs> during this time of the year. That, that didn't age well is, is like up there number one. If I, if I, get, if I get that, it's, it's an immediate block. It's, immediate, it's an immediate no in the comment section. Yeah. I actually, I fucking love it. I made a, I tweeted it out. I, I texted you guys, I think, but uh, someone basically, I was making a trade in one of my dynasty trades. I was gonna make a trade actually. He offered me like, he offered me something like Corlin Sutton plus like a bunch of junk for like Terry McLaurin plus like, you know, plus uh, Brian Edwards plus something else. I was like, yeah, like I'm not interested because I don't have any wide receivers. Uh, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to get rid of Raheem Mostert. I'm willing to trade him for like another wide receiver depth piece. And he hits me back. Portland Sun straight up for Raheem Mostert. I just fucking smashed it so quickly. And I, I tweeted it out. I tweeted it out. And, like, oh, it's, like, the fastest smash I've ever done. And, like, later on, like, after the San Francisco game plays, like, some random dude just, like, way to go, genius. I'm like, dude, <laughs> fucking, fucking Twitter's so awesome, man. It's yeah, always, Twitter's so always good. Always let like, you know. <laughs> it's, like, someone I've never met before. It doesn't follow me. Somehow it doesn't came follow you. You know, <laughs> you know what they did, too. Like, they just went in the search bar and typed in Mostert's name so yeah. that they could just, like, talk some shit. There was people that were going back, like, I tweeted out about Brandon Cooks like two weeks ago. Like, I can't wait for Brandon Cooks to blow up on Thursday Night Football. And then they're like, Brandon Cooks has a hamstring injury. So I tweeted out, like, for the record, don't start Brandon Cooks over Will Fuller. And then, like, two weeks later, we have, like, people going back to the Brandon Cooks tweets that don't follow me. And I'm like, literally, just go fuck yourself. <laughs> it's so good, man. It's so I good. I love it. I fucking you just have, love it, dude. You just have to laugh. I'm like, dude, like, life's, <laughs> life is too good for me to really get upset about, like, a David Johnson yeah. tweet. Like, this is not, yeah. not going to fucking phase me, all right? We're in laser vision. We're in week one. Let's talk, let's talk some actual football. Yeah. It's so good, though, because, you know, now that it's actually happened – Enough of these fucking hypotheticals, enough of these, like, what if they did this? What if this split happened? We have, like, real live football 
data to go after. We got fucking adoptions happening with Devontae Adams adopting the entire Viking secondary <laughs> for the entire game. Jesus fucking Christ. We got we got Adam Thielen garbage time locking in that wide receiver one status. Clearly the only game in town. I think the most interesting thing is um, I tweeted out earlier today, but uh, I think 14 wide receivers exceeded 40% of their team's air yards. And what that means is like the amount of distance that the ball traveled in the air uh, is how much they have. Right. And the reason why that's important is because the longer the ball travels in the air, the, the better they are for fantasy. Um, so you want guys like deep targets at the end of the day. They're just like more valuable targets. Let, yeah, let me ask you, targets. because we had, we had Devonte Adams f- uh, fathering people. And then we have Michael Thomas getting absolutely sunned. And the re- <laughs> I, br- I bring it up with these two. Because I would say that their dynasty value is probably closer than people want care to admit between oh, the yeah. two, right? Uh, I just had someone ask me, Georgie Memes, he's like, what, what, what do you think the dynasty value is between these two? I'm like, it's, it's probably not that far apart because someone in our league who has Michael Thomas offered him Michael Thomas for Devonta Adams straight up because the one who has Michael Thomas won the league last year. And he's like, and I just beat him in week one. So he's already like panicking and he's like, I might... <laughs> give it up just so I don't lose, you know, the next three weeks in a row. So he's someone who's contending immediately and he's panicking on the fact that Michael Thomas has the high ankle sprain. Michael Thomas is talking about how he can play through it, but like no. we've seen, we've seen this story before with a Saints <laughs> skill player trying to play through a high ankle sprain. It was not, it was not the best thing yeah. uh, for that player. So listen, um, I, I, I'm, I'm gave, I gave what up your thoughts on that are. I gave up on pl- believing in playing through high ankle sprains when Barkley couldn't do it. As soon as I saw that Barkley couldn't do it, I've immediately written off anyone else has a high ankle sprain. But uh, I think they're pretty close, man. I think, I mean, I personally still have Tyree Kill as my wide receiver one dynasty, which is probably not a popular take. But I think that tier one wide receivers, they all just go back to back. I mean, especially now that, like, Michael Thomas is a high ankle sprain, if you could just flip him for Devontae Adams, especially as a contender, like, I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah, like, they're the uh, same uh, age. They're in similar situations. Like, the only show in town, but it's really the only show in town in Green Bay because New Orleans, obviously, they brought in Emmanuel Sanders. They have Jared Cook, but they also have Alvin Kamara, who's a bit younger, so he's going to be around there. Both guys have older quarterbacks that are aging. Drew Brees, I believe he's on the last year of his deal. If Jameis Winston somehow takes over, we'll see what happens, but that guy's more interested in, like, staring at his Microsoft surface than actually watching the game. And then Aaron Rodgers, like Mike, possessed this past week, and I think that he's just on a fuck you tour for the entire NFL and he's just going to be an animal this season. So getting like half a season worth of like iffy production out of Michael Thomas this year, as opposed to like hopefully a full season out of Devontae Adams might make me lean Devontae Adams over Michael Thomas in the long haul because they're basically like the same age. And I think heading into this year, Devontae Adams like was my wide receiver one, just because you could expect him to see like 30 plus percent of the team's targets. Yeah. I actually just shipped off Devontae Adams. Great timing right before this, uh, but mainly because I was in a rebuild. <laughs> But I uh, shipped off Devontae Adams, Raheem Mostert, another, another great ship off. Uh, Raheem Mostert and Tariq Cohen for uh, Hollywood Brown, uh, 2021 first, 2022 first, 2021 second, 2022 second. So value wise, like uh, it's actually value wise probably on the Adams side, but like as a rebuilder, like you can't be too picky and choosy when you're selling studs because not everyone has, not everyone has like fucking bunch of like a lot of war chest of first to give up. Right. So I kind of took what I had and, and you know, hopefully I hit on a couple of those uh, first, first starts and, you know, I think Marquise Hollywood actually came out too. That's another good topic, right? Like, I think we brought this up before. Um, Marquise Hollywood Brown versus Kirk, uh, Christian Kirk. And, you know, I've actually recently come around a little bit on Marquise Hollywood, you know, mainly Hollywood. because of what you said, even yeah. before he blew up, actually. Um, but uh, just like looking at like someone, his profile, what he's done, and then what, what his value rise has been, the actual historical trends for someone of that profile is actually pretty good. So, disregarding his uh, collegiate breakout profile, because, you know, I kind of adjust my approach where, um, if someone comes to the NFL and kind of proves something, I'm going to like tend to weigh that more heavily. Same thing with like McLaurin, but yeah, yeah it's I like, you just kind of like stop, you stop looking backwards and you start looking yeah. at the, at the numbers that are like more yeah. recently. I think that, I think like maybe segueing off that, like Baker Mayfield, the Browns Fucking offense stinks. was, Oh my God, they, <laughs> they were so bad. And it makes you think like Baker was so prolific in college and it's like, okay, was it just because he was playing behind the Oklahoma offensive line who were like 30-year-old men playing against 15-year-old high schoolers in college? He has Mark Andrews he's throwing the ball, Highwood Brown, CeeDee Lamb throwing the ball. Joe like, Mason. Joe, yeah, like where, where do you go with Baker in a dynasty super flex league? Because if you, if you own Baker on your team, whenever you invested into him was probably an early round pick. Like even this year in super flex dynasty startups, like you probably had to use a fourth round pick, if not an earlier one on him. 
I know we don't want to go nuts about week one, but like, Mike, you made the point on Twitter about, you know, buying, buying high, right? Like yeah. you can buy something high and still squeeze plenty of juice out of it. Is this, yeah. you know, this is uh, on the flip side, like you could also sell low and still oh, yeah. get out before it gets worse. So like, this is a situation with like Le'Veon Bell, like Le'Veon Bell and dynasty, like this could be the last call for him with his fucking hamstring strain. If it keeps him out three or four weeks, what are you guys doing with a guy like Baker Mayfield? who's still really, really young and he'll get plenty of more play time to prove that he's okay. But yeah. like it shit was not good in week one. Yeah, I'm, uh, I don't have any Baker. I didn't invest in him in the year that he blew up because his price was too much. But I think you, I think you have to get out because kind of like what you said, right? Like the counter to buying high is selling low, and I sell low all the time, all the time. Because if I see like if, if a player is like taking a hit and take a big value hit, if I think they're going to continue trending down, like I'm not stuck on this sunk cost fallacy of like, hey, I invested a first-round pick. I need to get a first-round pick back. Like I don't care. I want to get like something back. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like um, with Darius guys, I had Darius guys on my dynasty league. You offered me something for him. And then like a couple of days later you pulled the offer back and I was like, fuck. Cause I went to go accept it. <laughs> and then like news came out that he just like beat up some women. And I was like, fuck, like now I get nothing for Darius guys when I should have sold them low because now I can't sell them for anything. Yeah. I mean that, that's like a, even a, a strange, a bigger example, but I'm talking about like for Baker, like you'd probably get a first, a first round pick, right? Uh, In a super flex league. Yeah. yeah. A mid first yeah. round pick. Like, I think pretty easily. And I would consider taking that because that mid first round pick has no chance of going down. It only has chance going up. And on the off chance that team takes Baker thinking he's going to be the one to push him into the playoffs and he doesn't, they could become an earlier pick. And then you're looking at someone like a Trey Lance, right? You're probably not going to get Trevor Lawrence because he's going 101. You're probably not going to get Justin Fields. You'll probably go 102, but you're looking like a Trey Lance, like a Najee is, Harris. Is and Trevor Lawrence, is Trevor Lawrence going to the Browns? Is he replacing Baker Mayfield? <laughs> If they, I mean, if they're bad enough to get 101, you have to take Trevor Lawrence, right? Like, yeah, I, th I think sure. you have to. There's, there's, there's no question about it. And look, I, I'm a big proponent of buying high, but I'm also a proponent of selling, uh, selling low because like you got to recoup something. It's kind of like when you're, when you're like running a shitty business, and I don't know if you're sure it goes, is goes and looks at their shitty ass inventory and tries to sell everything at discount to get like any sort of like cash value back. So if you can get draft pick back, if you can get whatever, just recoup it. Um, because like, like you said, man, it's, I'm not saying he's a product of the Oklahoma system cause he was really good in college, but like, as we're watching these Oklahoma, like quarterbacks, like Jalen Hurst went there, balled out, Kyler Murray balled out. Now you have Spencer Rattler balling out. So it's definitely like, it's not all in the system, but the system definitely contributes. Right. And Freddie Kitchens has to be so upset right now. He lost his job. Everybody was blaming <laughs> him. And now you see what's actually going on here. The thing is like, I don't know like how long. Odell's under contract or Jarvis Landry, but they cannot be happy playing with this guy. He had like 10 targets. He caught three balls. I know he dropped a few, but Baker just does not look confident. He doesn't look comfortable behind that offensive line, and he just doesn't look good. And you were talking about trading him away. I'm sure at this point, just looking at like his age and his perceived value, you can get like a Matthew Stafford. You can get a Jared Goff. You can even get like a Kirk Cousins, who they're all older. Actually, he might be like the same age as Jared Goff, but like they're all older. But who's to say that they don't have more longevity because they are locked up under contract mm -hmm. and they have shown to be good in the NFL. Whereas Baker Mayfield had a good rookie season, a terrible second year, and he started off extremely slow so far. And I know it's the Baltimore defense. That's, that's the, that's the crazy part. That's the crazy part is like, he was, pro, he was prolific in college and then he had the big rookie year. So you're like, Oh, we also have like an NFL sample size. And that's what I think makes it so tough to, to give him away. Cause you know, the great Ari gold once said once a star always a threat man if you if you've done it in the nfl it feels like you could pull it back from somewhere and i think it's like even i would have sellers remorse on baker mayfield but you're always going to be taking risk when you move a guy like that yeah, yeah i'm still I mean, dying matt asiata definitely. after a three touchdown game <laughs> <laughs> can never give that up baby <laughs> yeah I, it's like it's like i mean it's painful to watch right? i mean who would have thought that in 2020 like we'd be sitting here thinking about how like Baker was a downgrade for Odell over Eli fucking noodle arm Manning. Like Snacks I mean, was going nuts today. We were filming Fade the Public. He's like, so we can officially say that Eli Manning made Odell Beckham, not the other way around. He loved it. Yeah. So it's it's just a shitty situation. I think uh in the Browns backfield too, man. I wanna cause on that league I was talking about the Adams for MT switch. And I think we could talk about my three running backs in that league. I have three like big running backs that will be in my lineup week in and week out. It's Nick Chubb, Joe Mixon, and it's Austin Eckler. I think we could talk about their value perspectives from both redraft and dynasty because right now everyone's going nuts on whether they should sell these guys or buy these guys or like what they should be doing. 
what if you could rank them let's say just redraft for this season long right now uh if you could just own them straight up like what is the order you'd want them in going forward which one nick chubb who and who Eckler, chubb and eckler and mixon oh, okay um well i'm gonna go with probably mixon and eckler ahead of chubb um just because like i know we haven't seen it and it's fucking tilting that like mixon is not getting getting targets but he was running routes which is i guess the good part the the silver lining in that um and Eckler, we know he's going to have more receiving upside than one <laughs> one catch and one one target. I think you know people are pretty much. I don't think they're over, actually. I think they are overreacting a little bit on Eckler um, because like it's something that we know he's going to do. Like nobody's expecting a hundred targets again without Philip Rivers, but we also don't think that Tyrod Taylor is only going to target him sixteen times, right? So it, it, the, the truth kind of falls somewhere in between, and I just don't think. Chubb doesn't look like he has that upside, and he definitely yielded more groundwork than I thought he would to scream hunt this game. Yeah, it, it's tough to it's tough to like <clears throat> really get perspective from any of these games. I think like Eckler had twenty touches in this game. He had twenty touches twice all of last year. Most of them are groundwork, and the valuable work on the ground is the goal line, which went to Josh Kelly. But again, like not to, but also to rip on the Chargers. They're not going to be – like, Tyrod look like shit. They're not going to be in many games or at least, like, have this kind of game script where it dictate, it dictates Austin Eckler carrying the ball 19 times. Like, they play the Chiefs next next week. Yep. If Austin Eckler doesn't have at least, like, five or six targets in that one, that's when you start to worry and say, like, oh, shit. Like, maybe this offense will not actually run through Ty, uh, through Austin Eckler in the passing game. With Mixon, man, it's like, yeah, dude, this, this shit is crazy because we all know how talented he is in the passing game, but they're just not giving him that work. Like, it's still Geo. As long as Geo's there, it seems like – He's more – it's not even like, you know, mixing a raw talent is more athletic catching the ball, but I still feel like Gio's probably better suited in the two-minute drills. He's just, like, quicker and more agile and just, like, gets things going a lot quicker. And I just don't know if we ever see Mixon take that role from him. Yeah, that's why, for me, I would probably rank them Eckler, Chubb, then Mixon, just because on the flip side of what Austin Eckler saw, I don't think there's going to be many game scripts. Like, obviously, the Browns suck, but I don't think that there's going to be many game scripts where they're down 30 the entire game. And in the carries that he did see, he looked very, very good on them. Obviously, you can't yeah. tote the rock 20 times a game when you're getting your ass beat by the Baltimore Ravens. And although, like, Nick or Kareem Hunt also looked good, I just – I don't know. Nick Chubb is way too good of a running back to limit him to 10 touches a game. They're probably going to be a lot closer in other games this season than what they were this past week, especially playing like the Cincinnati Bengals twice this year. I know the Browns do have a tough schedule, but he just looks way too talented, and he's getting the role that we kind of expected him to get. Whereas Joe Mixon, I think ever since like his last year in Oklahoma coming into the season, uh, his rookie season, I think we just expect him to walk into 50 targets. I'm not sure he's ever going to get that in his career. It's going to be like 2027 where like this is the year where Gio Bernard <laughs> finally dies and he just steps in in every third down situation. So Joe Mixon does scare me a little bit. He did have that fumble and like the announcer went crazy. He's like, this is insane. He's never fumbled before. He's never fumbled before. As a Chargers fan, I really like that, but. Uh, I, he just he worries me just because this isn't a good offense. Their offensive line still isn't great. And I feel like it wasn't that bad of a game script. Like, they weren't getting blown out. It was a pretty slow-paced game, and he still wasn't dominating in the receiving game. And in the groundwork, he wasn't really finding much room to run. As for Austin Eckler, I agree with what both you guys said. There aren't going to be many games where he gets 19 carries in one target. And although Joshua Kelly did get all the goal line work, I don't see him just, like, the entire season getting every single goal line carry. I think if Austin Eckler is out there in like the two-minute drill, or even if he's out there and he has fresh legs, they're not going to sub him out to put in Josh Kelly because we've seen him do it on the goal line before last year when Melvin Gordon uh, was holding out. Yeah, I'm more I'm more concerned from the Nick Chubb standpoint of of the team not being good than Kareem Hunt's involvement because I mean we know Kareem Hunt's going to be involved, but they're not going to be down. Hopefully, they're not going to be down 30 points where that di- dictates Kareem Hunt being on the field more. So from like a from a long term perspective, it's easy to take the cop out move and say like, you know, uh, just hold on to these guys because they're all like too good to not succeed over the long run. But these are the type of moves that like kind of can make or break your dynasty team because you can give you can get something in a really really big haul if you send off a guy like Mixon if you're worried about him long term, uh, or if you send off one of these guys and package up a couple first and you know like an RB two or something like that. That could be the difference between success over the over the couple of years. So. Um, with I, I own all three of those guys on one dynasty team, and I'm like, I probably need to move one of them, and I probably need to figure out which one I need to move correctly. And I'm having trouble deciphering. Like, I want to hold on to Mixon because he's got he just locked up that contract extension, you know, and that's that's enough of a security thing for me for the second contract. With Nick Chubb, they just extended Kareem Hunt. Now, Kareem Hunt, I feel like 
I know they like him a lot, but I feel like this low key might make him an appetizing trade target for another NFL team. Because now if they get him, they know they have him until three years down the road for a cheap contract as, you know, and, and they don't have to pay him a big fat extension in two years or, you know, a year and a half or whatever when Kareem Hunt wants that. So I don't really know what the fuck I'm doing. So someone steer me in the right direction here. Yeah, I think, um, look, it, it is tough. And I actually think that trade, that trade angle for Kareem Hunt, like makes some sense because you sign, you sign him and you can actually use him as a trading ship. Versus mm-hmm. before, if you just if you just kind of let him walk, you get absolutely nothing, and it's not like it was a massive contract, like you said, right? Um, so I think that's definitely a possibility. Like, I I don't think you can sell Eckler at least right now because like just the panic is like is too much. Yeah. They're like they're like, oh my god, he yielded goal line work. He's a scat back. Like he didn't get any targets. Like Tyrod can't throw to running backs. Scat like, back that, with one target, gotta love it. Yeah, that full <laughs> narrative is like just getting a little bit a little bit too wild. And I'm actually not panicking on Eckler yet uh, yeah. because he also has a contract. And like if he does start seeing the the receiving work, and if he does start splitting some goal line work, which I would probably expect him to do. And Anthony Lynn straight up came out and said today, like, hey, we need to get Eckler more opportunities. Uh, granted, he, we're not we're running a different scheme with Tyrod, so we're not going to target him as much as we did last year. But we need to get him more opportunity. So that's what me. All that like, that was on, like right? a fucking like a two sided sword. I yeah. was like, you, I thank you, but also <laughs> you stabbed me in the chest. <laughs> yeah, you gave exactly. me a band aid after you stabbed me. I didn't yeah. know which way to take. That. Like Eckler is like one of those guys where I feel like if you're contending, his his like perceived value will never really exceed his production. I think yeah. so. Like in that situation, kind of like a Julio, like you're just not going to sell him. You're going to ride him and, and see what happens. Whereas like Chubb, like honestly best pure runner in the nfl i still think that and i think it's true like he's like elite like in every aspect of draft capital like he's got more name name value attached to him so like if you could explore like selling something like i'd probably say you you can still sell chubb like that'd be the one that i explore trading mainly because like if you look at the reaction on twitter when like kareem hunt signed or like when chubb had a bad game like the chubb truthers are just like completely disregarding him. like they're like well like fuck that like Chubb's way too good like there's no way he's gonna yeah. blah 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 like they just like it's they get so defensive and like, it's like point. Every, all of them are just like oh yeah like sell me your Chubb trade me your Chubb like all this stuff so like I feel like you can get way better Ima- market for imagine it. trading Nick Chubb right now yeah That's yeah I'm just- gonna do I'm gonna go into Twitter <laughs> and just search the word imagine in fantasy football Twitter and just retweet every terrible fucking imagine tweet imagine not yeah, so- Joe Mixon's and catch 80 balls with Joe with Joe Burrow behind <laughs> just imagine yeah. <laughs> Yeah, drives, drives so, me fucking crazy. I, I do agree with the Nick Chubb take, but I just fucking traded for Nick Chubb in this offseason. Now I like don't want to give him up. Because <laughs> I do think he's so good, but like there's just so there's just a lot of fucking red flags right there in Cleveland right now. And you're right, like he'll always have the highest perceived value because he's not built like Austin Eckler, and he's already proven that he can run for you know 1,400 yards when he needs to. And I don't know. You're right. The the, the value on a guy like Nick Chubb is. And he's still so young too, so it's yeah. gonna continue to be there for a couple of years. Yeah, and he's a beast. And like your common guys, and go to player profile and be like, this guy looks like Saquon Barkley, and that's like the bottom line. So he looks like game so, over. Um, yeah, I would I would explore trading trading Chubb, um, just because like at least with Mixon, like you have guaranteed volume. Like, would the targets get there or not? I'm not sure, but like there's gonna be games where he just gets like literally 30 touches, and yeah. there's zero threat to him on the goal line, right? There's like Joe's like kind of a threat, but honestly, like he's not even really a threat. So it's like they're not throwing the running backs, period. Um, no, all, all he does is cap Mixon ceiling a little bit. Like the yeah. ceiling that the perceived ceiling that we think Mixon could get to one day. Yeah. It's just it's just not gonna be there as long as Gio's there. Yeah. But that doesn't mean he can't have like a twenty touch floor. Yeah, exactly. And like and Mixon has zero threats on the goal line. There's just like right. no question on the goal line if it's carry, it's going to Mixon. That there's like literally zero threats. So I think the certainty there is, is pretty good. Austin Eckler, you don't have as much perceived value, so you can't really sell him and then that kind of just like cross elimination leaves Chubb. Yeah, I also think the Bengals are trying to build the right way, too, because they invested in left tackle. They did get Billy Price, who I'm not even sure is like still on the team. He's always hurt. And then they got what seems to be a franchise quarterback in Joe Burrow, despite not having a great debut. I think just the way that they're building their team lends it to be a good situation for Joe Mixon down the road. Hopefully, he is involved in the passing game. As I said before, we've been saying that for a long-ass time, and it hasn't happened yet. But he seems to have a, a pretty good situation. I would argue that his perceived value right now is a little bit lower than Nick Chubb's because we've never really seen Joe Mixon hit his ceiling, whereas Nick Chubb in his rookie year, the second half was incredible. His second year was very good as well. And even though Kareem Hunt is there, like he still put up, what, like 70, 80 yards last game against a pretty tough Baltimore front seven. So I still think that he has the highest perceived value because he looks the part of an NFL workhorse back, although the passing down work is there. 
I still think people are low on Austin Eckler just because he's an undrafted free agent and Josh Kelly's like a fourth round pick that runs in a straight line and scored a touchdown week one. So I don't think he's somebody that's worth selling just because as Mike said, like his perceived value isn't as high as the amount of points he's going to actually give you on a week after week basis. They just extended the guy. Their offensive line is better than it was in the past. So I'm still pretty high on Austin Eckler. So again, that leaves us with Nick Chubb on the trade block. Yeah. Speaking of Joe Burrow, uh, what do you guys think about the premiere of the, of the number one overall pick, you know, the, the chosen one, the guy who, the guy who was supposed (laughs) to like break the rookie TD passing record and have all this passing yard. I thought it was a little bit crazy, but uh, like I, I thought, I thought, you know, he did pretty well to be honest, considering what he was up against, like the chargers, chargers D line is no slouch. Their secondary is no slouch. They got fucking Chris Harris jr. Locking up Tyler Boyd all day in the slot. And you got Casey Hayward on the outside. I'll tell you what, man. I, uh, I think they left a lot on the field, statistical, like when you're looking at from the numbers. Like A.J. Green left about a buck and two touchdowns on the field, not by his fault. There was, you know, a toe tap that he didn't get in. There was a – Burrow overthrew him on like yeah, a 40-yard yeah. touchdown by, by a couple feet. There was the touchdown with like three seconds left where he got the offensive pass interference. So I think like for all intents and purposes, you look at the box score, obviously it wasn't good for Burrow. But for the first rookie start, again, not the easiest uh, first matchup. It's – I, th- I think he'll be fine going forward. Like, I mean, he flashed that athleticism that we're all pretty high on, and I think the arm will get there in time once he gets a little more on-field time with his guys and Tyler Boyd's not getting locked down by Chris Harris. But really, uh, looked really – like, A.J. Green looked really good. I mean, that yeah. connection looked really, really good despite what the box score ended up with. Um, I, l- I like what I saw from Burrow. I just think we're obviously spoiled with what we see from rookie quarterbacks now and, like, debut games. And if it's not 403, you know, we're not impressed by it. But, um, no, what do you, you think against your boys? Oh, I, I loved everything Joe Burrow did last night. It was uh, it was very good for me. But I do like that he showed his rushing upside. I'm not sure if it was like a design run or whatever he scored on, but it was like a 23-yard scamper or something. He like followed his blocks well. He found his way to the end zone. And then he didn't do too well passing the ball. But I think that just kind of works hand in hand with his rushing ability because if he is being pressured like he was last game, he's going to be able to run. If he isn't getting as much pressure and he does have a clean pocket for once, he's going to be able to hit Tyler Boyd and AJ Green deep down the field. So I think his kind of dual threat ability that not many people give him respect for, for some obvious reasons, uh, I think that should be a little bit more respected, like a Gardner Minshew or Ryan Tannehill, what they bring to the table. And I think for fantasy purposes, that gives you a very, very good option. Like Daniel Jones, this past game that just ended, he absolutely sucked, but he threw like two touchdowns and he ran pretty well. So that gives you good enough fantasy, uh, a good enough fantasy floor. And he has a ceiling that he can bring with his legs or his arm on a week to week basis. So Although it wasn't a great statistical performance for him, just looking at the box score, I think he showed a lot of upside. Other than that little shovel pass to uh, Giovanni Bernard, that like Melvin Ingram intercepted with one hand. If a D lineman <laughs> intercepts you with one hand, no, it I love Melvin out. Ingram, bro. <laughs> Melvin Ingram's kind of like the goat. Like I love him after he Hard Knocks. He's just so fucking like cool, calm, and collected, and just a beast on the field. I, I he put a lot of pre- they, they had a lot of pressure on Burrow in this game too. I think that was the other thing. Like everyone's super excited about the Bengals kind of turning things over. And I feel like we're probably one year too early on the real excitement for the Bengals offense because uh, this offensive line is not going to go from like last to top five, top 10 within the course of a year. And I'm looking at some numbers now because I was watching uh, some of the game pass because I wanted to rewatch like Boyd and AJ Green and see, you know, what the deal was with the wide receivers there. Um, and I, I thought Burrow was under pressure a lot. And I'm looking at it now and only Wentz and Dak Prescott were pressured on more dropbacks than Joe Burrow in week one. So I feel like that might be a common thing. But again, like the Chargers all, all have a great front step and they're going to get pressure on pretty much any um, any offensive line group that they go against. Yeah, I, th- I thought, Eagles, you know, they look like fucking shit last night. <laughs> I can't even I, I talked about this so much today, but that ma- that matchup was just like, holy shit, like the front seven from Washington and the O line for Philly is going to be a problem. Yeah. Dude, I played uh, I played a lot of Washington Redskins DFS yesterday on uh, on DK because they were the cheapest cool. defense available. And yeah. as soon as I saw Lane Johnson was out, I'm like, "Whoop! Here come the sacks!" And you know, for the first half, I was like, "Well, I was fucking dumb. Why did I? Why did I play? Why did I play them?" <laughs> but but then after that, it was they just got absolutely fucking murdered, right? And I I don't know what happened to Djax. I, I thought he got injured. Someone said he got injured. But then it turns he, out he wasn't injured. Like he was like off the field for a little while, and it looked like he was like wincing in pain. But he ended yeah. up coming back on the field like yeah. a drive later or something. Yeah, so it wasn't. I guess it wasn't serious. But like you know, he got you know he had like thirty targeted air yards uh, per thing. So you know he was exactly what you would have thought he was. But you know he just didn't burn him. And then obviously we had Rager in the game, made that great catch, and then and then obviously nothing else. But I think the most interesting thing here, and I tweeted it today, 
is Goddard versus Ertz, man. If you have Ertz on your dynasty teams, which I do in one team on, on the BDG inaugural dynasty league, I'm fucking worried, man. I got, I got Ertz. I got Michael Thomas not starting out good for me, but, uh, I'd be worried because this is your downfall, motherfucker. You finally yeah. got hit with some bad karma. <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, I, I looked at the snaps and I, I pulled up the PFF stuff and Ertz and Goddard. I, I they're close. Like last season, last season started like Goddard was already kind of like working his way in, and by all accounts, like if you gave me the same amount of touches for Goddard versus Ertz, I would take Goddard 100 times out of 10 because he's just a better football player, and it's I don't even think it's that close because Ertz is a fall and catch guy and at the tight end position like you make your money off of like being able to create yards after the catch right and that's what like the top guys do like Kelsey the kiddos like they're all run after the catch type guys and Goddard does that and if you look at the key things to focus on on tight end is not snaps right because you don't give a fuck about tight ends coming in and blocking because you don't get points for pancakes unless you play in a league with one if you do please invite me I'd be interested (laughs) <laughs> but if not, like you want to look at the snaps, but you want to look at the routes run because you want to look at if they're actually having an opportunity. Think of think of a route run for tight end as like an almost like a like a poor man's version of a carry, right? Like if they're out there yeah. running routes, they have the potential to earn a target. And then the next step you want to look at is like when, how many routes do they run when the quarterback dropped back? Because if the quarterback dropped back, that marries intent with opportunity, right? If they drop back, they're intending to pass. If you're running a route, you have the opportunity to catch the pass. So you marry those things together. And by all accounts, like Ertz, his percentage of – How would they uh, be running a route without the quarterback dropping back? Um, can't run just a do route it all the time. I don't know. I don't know, to be honest, but that's, that's like the number. That's the number that, uh, that I'm looking at. Because like, oh, wait, sorry, yeah, they, they can't. They can't. That's why the drop back will always be higher than your route run. Is what I'm saying, right? So if you take the routes run divided by the drop back, that gives you like how often are you running routes when the quarterback drops back versus staying in line to pass block or whatever. Gotcha. Right? Um, okay. So if you look at Mark Andrews, for example, I was, I was like, "There's no way I'm I'm outsmarting Mike right now and what he's talking about," but like I'm just gonna fucking throw it out there in case I was. Uh, yeah. They were like 38, 31, right? It was it was really close between Ertz. Yeah, and, they they were they were basically dead even, and and like people said like, oh, that's only like one game. But if you look back to like the last three or four games, like Zach Ertz only ran like two more routes per game than um than than Dallas Goddard. And we know if you put that in context with everything else, with like the contract negotiations, you know Ertz is not happy. That's He's that's fucking, what's scarier, yeah. man. Like when you, when you dive outside the numbers a little bit and you start looking at it from like a real life fucking like, what if they ship Zach Ertz for an offensive lineman right now? Which is what they fucking need. And what I originally thought too, that's why I knew the numbers off the top of my head with the routes run, because I was looking at it today and I was like, maybe, maybe what they did last year was similar or they did in week one was similar to what we saw the Rams do where their offensive line was playing miserable. So they kept one of the tight ends in to block more. That wasn't the case. It was, you know, Ertz was still running his routes. Goddard was running his routes too. Goddard was just way more involved in the passing game. Looked like a better player making plays down the seam. Ertz had the one touchdown in the beginning and that's, that might be like your cell window right there to have like one or two good games while the uh, the rest of the the, the players are kind of like banged up on Philly. But who knows how long this lasts for? And you're right. Like if I own Ertz and Dynasty, he's someone that I'm probably trying to look to flip. Yeah, I forgot how good Goddard was down the stretch last year. I have a tweet by John Daigle, but his at is not John Daigle. So I don't know what his like actual name is. That dude blocked me. Did he? He, he got big mad. I created the Roto, Roto World thing, right? <laughs> Well, I'll read it so you can understand what he said. He said, since week their week 10 bye last year, Dallas Goddard has averaged 83% of the team snaps, eight targets per game, and a 19.2% target share. So, like you were saying, Mike, he's not Hold just up. out on the field. That can't be right. He can't be, I'm taking he can't be on 83, 83% of the snaps. Like, no tight end plays that high. That's what he said. I, Maybe this is why he blocked you, Mike. He's just spreading fake news. Well, you have to pull he, yeah, he's spreading fake news, and we know, <laughs> now we're spreading it even more. Since There's week no what? Since week what? Uh, after the week 10 by last season, this is a live uh, thinking. I'm leaving this in the episode. Yeah. You have to fucking leave this in. There's no, like no tight ends play 84. Like there's very, very few that play that high number of, of snaps. Uh, I so it. I have the snaps for Goddard. Um, I don't have the total snaps for the team in those weeks though. So I have to double check. If you go, I could do it right now. I'll pull it up. Hold on. Let's see, week yeah, 11. He played 81, 88, 57, 68. 84, 90, 100%. And then in the playoffs, he played 97. Got her. What did you say, week nine? Uh, after the week 10 bye, so week 11 and nine. Week 10. 77, 64, 55, 54, 84, 92, 100. So whatever that average is out to, I don't – that's definitely not at 80. Um, you might have counted the playoffs too. I have the playoffs at 97%. Okay. Okay. Maybe that does make sense, including yeah. the playoffs. Yeah, I'm not usually looking at those numbers, I guess, for fantasy and stuff. But, yeah, that's a high fucking number because over the first yeah. half of the season he was around – 
50 to 60. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty fucking eye-opening. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they also played 12 personnel a lot, right? I mean, they had no wide receivers yeah. back, back then, so it, it totally makes sense. But it's just like, if you look at the numbers, like, I mean, last year, uh, percentage of dropbacks, Ertz ran around 80%, and God was at 56%. This year, it's 75 versus 61 so far. So, like, you know, I think that the window to sell is now because Ertz kind of still has that lead, and I'm sure he'll have a couple big games coming up. But, I mean, I just it's, – it's, like, really hard to see them signing him to an extension. And, and on the off chance they do, we already know that Goddard still has value because it's kind of like the, the Patriots with, um, with Hernandez and Gronk, uh, a, a way poor, 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 poor man's version of that. But you kind of know that he has value standalone. And, honestly, where would you guys have Goddard in your ranks if, if, if uh, Earth was gone? Because he would, he would immediately jump into my top, like, my tier two behind. Season longer Earth. dynasty. Dynasty. He'd probably be I mean, like top too, five or six. He'd be ahead of like Darren Waller for me. He's got to be top five. I have him running out in. Uh, I have I had him starting in a fantasy league against uh, what's his name Curtis Curtis Patrick or whatever. Yeah. I mean he should have whooped my ass this, this week. But I had guys like Dallas Goddard in and Miles Sanders is out of my lineup, so I was playing guys like DeAndre Swift and my team. Just one of those weeks where like you shouldn't have won, but my team put up like 175 points. And it was because of guys like Goddard. He's like my tight end one there, completely comfortable with it. And that yeah, if that was the question, he would be. Yeah, you'd have Kittle up there. You would have Kelsey up there. You'd have Andrews up there. And then, like, I, it's I would have got her. I would yeah. have got her. And I would I have got her in my four. Yeah, I, think I would have got her in the exact same tier as, as, uh, as Andrews and, and them. So, look, it's, 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 uh, it's pretty exciting to think about. Um, but, like, if you're an Ertz owner, like, you should be worried. Because I know a lot of people draft their Ertz for value, for value uh, this year. But uh, just looking at the numbers, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty telling. And if this usage, like, this trend continues, like, you're gonna be fucked. You're not gonna be able to sell them. So, so like, right now, so right now, you flip Ertz for Goddard in Dynasty. What I yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. How about Ertz for Hunter Henry? Dude, Hunter Henry had a good game, man. He had a very um, good game. He had dude, Mike Williams game. looked fucking him. good. Yeah. Mike Williams looked awesome. Yeah, that's what he does. He looks awesome, and then he gets hurt right after he yeah. looks awesome. That's like <laughs> someone, his- someone had the perfect tweet that in response to your tweet about Mike Williams having one arm, and he's like, "Yeah, like no matter how Mike Williams looks, he always puts up eight fantasy points." Just for, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty fucking accurate. Yeah, and then someone was like, "He can have eighty touchdown catches next year, and he'll still be a ninth round pick." And I was like, "What? What is the? What is the enigma of fucking Mike Williams, bro? I don't get it." But he he looked he looked good, and he just gets absolutely walloped on every single play. It feels yeah. like <laughs> there's never a play where he's not getting hit by. A fucking Mac truck. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a beast. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean Hunter Henry's interesting. Like it was a great day for tight ends. I mean Mark Andrews. Like I pulled up the digits for him. Like he didn't he regress ran yet. A route, Yeah, he ran a red. Well, first of all, yeah, I'm still confused as to how he kept scoring touchdowns because you know because regression was supposed to hit. I yeah. have no idea how it happened, but he ran a route on 93 percent of the team's dropbacks compared mm. to 62 percent of the team's dropbacks last year. He played 71 percent of the snaps compared to 41% of the snaps last year. So I was, oh. I was told he couldn't play more than 40% because of his, uh, his, his treatment, whatever the fuck he has going on with him. But like, yeah. there was, I literally like brought people on that were doctors, and they're like, no, that's, that's not why, because they can contain that during the games. People are like, no, that's the asthma or whatever the fuck he has is going to keep him off the field. So, so Mark yeah. Andrews. Tight end one is absolutely in play for Mark Andrews on the season. And I've had him as my tight end two for a while, drafted him ahead of Kelsey. I think, you know, I think that's a pretty easy decision. I know some people still want to draft Kelsey, but just given the age, it's not even close to me. But he, he's going to be a fucking baller. And, like, just on that point, man, like, all of these people that were supposed to fucking regress, like, hey, guess what? They didn't regress because they're fucking good. Aaron Jones, touchdown. Like, Lamar Jackson, Mark three, Andrews, touchdown. Three passing touchdowns. Lamar Jackson, three touching, three passing touchdowns. That's a lot like, for a running back. If you're, if you're fucking <laughs> good, you're just going to – you're going to score. Like, the simple concept of regression is people going back to the average – and if you still don't realize that the average is made up of people above the average, if you're below the average, I cannot fucking help you, man. I don't know what to say. Like, the regression drones are just killing me right now. Sometimes Wait, it's I, like, too easy. Like, Mark Andrews is the only guy on that team that catches passes that's over, like, five foot eight, And that team's in the red zone every fucking play. Like, who do you think's going to catch yeah. those balls? He's, like, so good. Yeah, it it's makes- ridiculous. It makes no – yeah, people – when yeah, when people start just talking about regression over the actual fucking situation, it drives me crazy. Dude, there was uh, – a live bet on DraftKings Sportsbook, or maybe it was FanDuel Sportsbook. They put Saquon Barkley over nine and a half rushing yards for the second half. Nine and a half rushing yards. And, like, I saw just people tweeting it out, like, thank you for posting this. Someone originally posted it, and everyone took the bet, and he didn't get it. He ended up, (laughs) 
he ended up getting like six yards or something in the second half and everyone's like i got baited so fucking hard <laughs> i'd be so pissed. he ended up with fewer rushing yards than ben roethlisberger did jesus christ we should That's sell nice. saquon barkley right <laughs> yeah we sold him already i think yeah. pittsburgh's defense is just so fucking good they're they so are good. Incredible. Incredible. tj That's watt is incredible like, People say Clyde over to is a bad goal line back, but like when you watch the game, he had nowhere to run. The same thing this oh, week. Like dude. people aren't gonna say Saquon Barkley's a bad running back after this game. Like you watch the game, they had no offensive line helping them with that pass rush and the way that they were stuffing the run as well. Like he had nowhere to run. You're not gonna sell a guy yeah. because they play the Pittsburgh defense or like the Houston front line. You just gotta you gotta wait it out. There's surprisingly there's like fifteen more weeks of this to go. So yeah. let's really like let's, uh, let's talk about that. I mean, I've I've crowned the anti CEH people as mental gymnasts because the amount of gymnastics they have to go through to actually discredit him is, has been absolutely outstanding. But I mean, the, the stuff we're seeing this week now is like CEH like did not get targets in the game. He did not convert. Like he had six goal line carries. There, there is no world where getting six goal line carries on the Kansas City Chiefs is a bad thing. If you convert it to the average of 30, like one in three, You'd be talking about a three fucking touchdown game. They're, they're just like, all the, yeah, all that means, all that means is that he's going to have multiple 30 point games yeah. over the rest of the season. Like I brought it up so much throughout the, throughout the summer. Once CH got drafted, I was like, dude, in, in the games, this exact stat in the games where, where Patrick Mahomes is the starting quarterback, the running backs for the chiefs average like 1.75 touchdowns per game. No different in that game. Like he should have been in multiple. T- I think the better question becomes from a redraft perspective right now, this point forward, you taking JT or CEH? CEH. Ooh, I'm taking forward. CEH. You got to take CEH. In just, they, they showed their cards with Naeem Hines. Like, yeah. they clearly want to use him very, very heavily. But, I mean, the receiving work for Taylor was, was, was crazy. Um, he, I think it, it, Jonathan RB1. Taylor had a higher percentage of targets on routes run uh, than anyone. Like, he got targeted on 50% of his routes, which is incredible. Like, I tweeted out that tweet after CEH went up, blew up, and had no targets. I'm like, hey – What's going to happen when Jonathan Taylor goes out and has like six catches for 80 yards? Ended up with six catches for 67 yards. So I was a little bit short, but it's actually, it's crazy, man. I think to me, like this is a positive, right? Like we, the, the, both the guys showed something that we were concerned about, right? Everyone's concerned about CH being a goal line back because he's small. Guess what? No concerns anymore. Everyone's concerned about Jonathan Taylor in the passing game. Guess what? No concern anymore. No, no drops. He was incredibly effective. His first touch, obviously explosive. This guy hit fucking... He's fucking like 20 something miles per hour, like within the four yard, like burst of the edge. Like he is going to be a fucking problem. CH is going to be a fucking problem. Like I would just be happy if you had JT, if you got JT in the third round of redrafts. Yeah. Jesus Christ. You just, you're so, you're going to pretend like you're upset about Marlon Mack getting hurt, but like go fuck yourself. Like, you're, <laughs> you're so Jesus happy Christ. about it. Yeah. yeah I he would have been like one fourth of his way to killing us on our bet with Animal. He would have been like six out of 28 catches. <laughs> way yeah. That would have sucked for us. I, I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, that we get to see JT in the starting role now because, yeah. like, there's going to be it. That the debate that went on all summer was the JT versus CH, and now we have a very fair playing field because yeah. it's not like you know, it's not like anyone else is in the way and we have to wait for next year for JT to get a shot. Now it's rookie, rookie situations are exactly what we talked about all summer, and now we get to see them flat out play. Yeah. So it's going to be really exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm just it's cool that we get to watch both of them, uh, just, just do their thing. It's gonna be yeah. fun. For totally agree. I, I'm like, I'm definitely, I'm super fucking pumped. I think it's going to be. It's going to be electro, man. And I think CH was, I mean, he just looked incredible. Like, especially on that TD run. Like, I mean, he clearly knows what he's doing. Like, he has the vision. He has, like, the step. And the, the scheme is working out perfectly for him in the run because he has so much space to work with. So and, like, when, when a linebacker lines up, like, one-on-one, tries to stack this guy on the open field, it's just not going to work, right? And I, I'm just fucking excited. I mean, on the flip side of that, though, Cam Akers looked fucking awful. Um, yeah. Cam Akers didn't look at all. He just closed yeah, the he and just, ran up the middle. Dude, like, he was just... Like, there was, like, no change of pace. Like, every time he got the ball, it was just, like, one speed directly into, like, wherever he thought. He just did what we thought Malcolm Brown would do, and Malcolm Brown did what we thought Cam <laughs> yeah. Akers was going to do. It yeah. was ugly, man. But I don't know. There's Something about me just tells me the talent will eventually win itself out over the long – like, there's no way we're going to look back and be like, yeah, Malcolm Brown carried the ball 200, <laughs> 275, yard, yeah. 275 times this year. You know, Darrell Henderson's going to get work back in. I think that will end up being a committee and being a, a really tough situation to have confidence in starting one of these guys. Yeah. Are, are you guys comfortable putting some, like, out of all the all the guys that we didn't expect to blow up, blow up, like Naheem Hines, Malcolm Brown, uh, James Robinson. I want to talk about him in a little bit, but James Robinson. Like, who are you most comfortable putting your fab on? Because I think that's going to be a question on most people's minds. Like, for me, I'm not even touching uh, Hines, to be honest with you. I think he's going to be too expensive to be overpriced. Uh, but I'm, I'm 
more comfortable trying to bid on someone like Malcolm Brown, just get a couple starts out of him uh, before like Cam Akers takes over. Um, but I'm willing to blow everything. I'm willing to blow it all on, on James Robinson. Um, I don't know about you guys. How do you guys feel about that? Pause. <laughs> no, I'm actually really high on Malcolm Brown. As you said, even if it's a few weeks, like the role that he saw, he got the goal line work. He had four targets and he was pretty efficient. He actually looked decent out there playing. Like their offensive line isn't great, but they seem to want to commit to him against like it was supposed to be a high scoring game against the Dallas Cowboys high octane offense with three wide receiver ones Mike I know you love that narrative they didn't look all too great out there I know they do have a few tough matchups coming up so maybe that's like the passing they forced to Cam Akers but I think you still get like two to three good more more good matchups out of him just because of the workflow that he's going to see both on the goal line and in the passing game Naheem Hines I am a little bit higher higher on him than you Mike just because Philip Rivers is all he does is throw to the slot and throw to his running back and like we made the argument, oh, he's had Danny Woodhead. He's had Melvin Gordon. He's had all these guys who can catch. He's had Keenan Allen in the slot. It just turns out, like, the guy doesn't want to throw downfield. And he showed that with Naheem Hines. Naheem Hines was in, I don't know the exact amount of, like, touches he got in the red zone. But even when Marlon Mack was playing, like, he got the red zone care and he scored on it. So I'm not sure what they're trying to do with him in this offense. He's, like, 180 pounds and he might be the goal line back for some odd reason. But I still think he's going to be somebody that sees like four to five targets a week out of the backfield. Mm. He's going to be mixed in between the 20s because it seems like that they like him in that offense. But I guess we'll talk on uh, talk about James Robinson later. But that guy like looks legit. Yeah. Like, he looks like a really good running back. Yeah, just on Naheem Hines real quick. Like the, Here's my problem with Naheem Hines. Right? Like, I, I don't think he, the goal line uh, role is there for him to stay. I think what happened was like, they're like, fuck, like, we just lost him out of the Mac and we were expecting him to play this, this whole game. And JT, you know, he – probably wasn't even ready uh, for a lot of that stuff. So I think going forward, it's going to be that. But, like, I just – I do not invest in scat backs. I do not invest in scat backs that do not have a lead role on the ground or goal line work because, like, even though it sounds sexy, like, oh, Tariq Cohen finishes an RB1, James White finishes an RB1, like, you don't fucking know when to start these guys, man. Like, at the running back position, I'm looking for some security, some floor, and some guaranteed volume, and you just don't know when they're going to get it because you don't – like, you're basically starting a wide receiver in your running back slot which is not what you want to do. So that's why I'm like a little bit concerned with Naheem Hines. Like, even though I know that Philip Rivers is going to target him, right? Like, and I just like, I refer to it as like functional points as like, how many of those points do I realistically get into my lineup? Like the, the year that Tariq Cohen was an RB1, like how many, how many RB1 weeks did some people actually realize from starting him, right? Unless you're willing to literally plug him in every single week, which I'm, which I'm not willing to do. So that's my problem with Naheem Hines. That's why I like Malcolm Brown. And then we'll talk about James Robinson. Yeah, I think um, my I, Naeem Hines, I do feel like, is is going to be too flashy for me to want to buy in on. There's so many comparisons with, like, is Naeem Hines this year's Austin Eckler? No. The problem with that is even if he had Austin Eckler's role from last year, he doesn't – like, Eckler had multiple touchdowns of, like, 40, 60, 80 yards. Naeem Hines is a career, like, 3.5 yards per carry guy, a career, like – six yards per catch guy he has no stealing on big plays and explosive plays so you have to have the volume there in the passing game or else he's not going to get you those fantasy points whereas Eckler last year could only get 11 or 12 touches but probably get into the end zone or you know turn one of those into a 40 or 50 yard catch so I think he's going to have a big role like the Colts the Colts seem really adamant in doing that but I just don't think he has anywhere near uh, a ceiling of of the explosive plays that we get from guys who are in his role or the ones that you want when you're when you're grabbing a guy in his role when it comes to James Robinson and, and Malcolm Brown like James Robinson the, just the fact that they trust him that much is like really uh, a confidence booster from a fantasy play because I think he, he now has a Leonard Fournette floor um, yeah. and I think uh, what I'm excited to see is what happens when the Jacksonville Jaguars are in game scripts that we expected them to be in this year right because like Minshew threw the ball 20 times and they won the fucking game. Like, that's not something that we're going to see happen week in, week out. And we'll probably more so see Minshew throw the ball closer to 30, 35 times a game. And when that happens, you know, do they turn more to throwing the ball to the running backs? Does James Robinson get four to five targets a game? Because if so, if he's getting 100% of the fucking goal line or the uh, running back carries plus four to five targets, James Robinson could be like a, a sneaky, like RB16, RB15 in fantasy if he's going to keep that up for the, for the remainder of the year, you know? Yeah, that yeah. catch and run he had was ridiculous. He, like, hurdled two people in one jump and kept going. It was reminiscent of that Saquon Barkley run against <laughs> Iowa in college where he jumped over two guys. Probably got, like, 25 inches higher than what Robinson got on that jump. But, like, he <laughs> Barkley just, had like, more fucking hurdles tonight in tonight's <laughs> game than he did rushing yards. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he was, he was real shitty. But, I don't know, I was kind of surprised by him. Like, I knew what his stature was, like, 5'9", like, 220-ish. 
he just like looks bigger than that on the field. Like I'm no yeah. like full film grinder, but like he looked like he could handle the workload. He obviously saw like a bunch of touches. He looked good between the tackles. I know that offensive line isn't great. And the Indianapolis Colts are supposedly like they're supposed to have a good defense. But he was tearing them up pretty early. And then he got that one reception later on in the game. Chris Thompson was a non-factor. The other two running backs, like Reichwell Armstead, doesn't seem like he's going to be back anytime soon. IR. Goes on like a three-week IR. So I think if he runs away with the job early, like he's not going to cede it to anybody in this offense. Like Chris Thompson is extremely one-dimensional. And those other two guys have never done anything in the NFL. So I think he got – he put his best foot forward week one against a pretty strong defense in a game script that like we weren't expecting it to end up that way. But I think if they do want to throw, he's somebody that can catch the ball out of the backfield as we saw week one. And he can definitely run between the tackles. Yeah, I think I think we saw what play out, what we thought would play out, right? Like Leonard Fournette leaving, like it gave a big boost to James Robinson, but also gave a big boost to LaVisca Chanel, who had a pretty damn good debut. Uh, I mean, I felt like a fucking proud father because we, and I, all three of us have been standing this guy for quite some time since the draft. And he went out and balled, but like, man, James Robinson looked good. Like I'm not a film grinder at all, but when I was watching him run, like he just looked fucking good. He, I mean, honestly, he, he looked better than like Leonard Fournette did last year <laughs> running behind the same team, the same O-line. Like granted, he does not have the top end speed. Like that was abundantly clear that Fournette has. Um, but like in terms of like just getting those like, you know, five to like 10 yards, like he can absolutely do it. And he had a hundred percent of the team's carry. So, you know, I think a lot, there's a lot of fluff that goes around a lot of coach speak that comes leading up to the season. But like when, when coach speak lines up with what I see on the field, that makes me a believer. So when the coach comes out and says, we believe in him, we think he can handle the workload and he's going to handle the workload and he goes out and gets a hundred percent of the carries plus a target. I'm, I'm in. So I, I believe what they say versus like someone else coming out and saying like, this guy's a workhorse and then goes in and is a fucking committee. Like obviously his, his words don't count for shit. Right. But everything they've said has played out. So I, I'm in a position, I, I covered this in the market watch Monday, but like, I don't think you should be rushing to like sell high on someone like James Robinson. Like, I'm sure many people will go out and be like, no, hey. Someone, someone that young and someone that unknown, like you, yeah. you should hold on to. You know, if he was like 26, 27, he's just getting in there for like a, you know, a, a small role or something like that, and you had an exciting week one, you can get rid of him. But this seems like something more than that. There's yeah. something more to it. Yeah, like don't go out selling him for like a couple third-round picks. Because your dream, your dream when you draft those third-round pick is you, is you hope that one of them has the opportunity to shine as he does now. And like like we said, Azigbo is on IR fucking – you know, right quell Armstead is on IR and he fucking stinks. So by the time they come back, like this could just be his role and you could be looking at Leonard Fournette. Like, and and the Jacksonville Jaguars have every incentive to keep him. This is an undrafted free agent. You have an undrafted free agent at running back. You have an undrafted free agent at quarterback, both on their fucking rookie deals. Like that opens up the world. Even if they're both just average, like NFL average, that opens up the world for them in terms of roster construction elsewhere. So I think it's an exciting one. You got to hold on to him. I'm not selling for anything. I don't even know if I'm going to sell him for a second. I'll probably sell a couple for seconds, but like I'm not selling him for anything less than a 2021 second in super flex formats at this point. So you're saying I should decline Scott's offer of a 2021 first or a fourth. He offered me a fourth <laughs> I counter offered with a first and then he sent me two fourths. So I'm really thinking about it right now. <laughs> Scott, nah, Scott's the goat. Fuck a fourth. Scott's the goat. Now fuck a fourth. I'm going to make a t-shirt that says fuck a fourth. <laughs> <laughs> that's our, that's our fucking motto. We never trade for fourths. Yeah. Fuck multiple thirds. Like, unless you're getting a second, like, just don't even consider it. Just straight up to delete that from your box because his upside is worth it. Like, we're not saying he's going to be an RB1, but, like, this is a potential starter that you'll have in Dynasty. And starting running backs don't come by often. And I, I think I compared this situation most commonly to, like, Philip Lindsay, right? Like, when he had his rookie season, undrafted free agent, came out of nowhere, a lot of buzz in training camp, coaches say he didn't get the job, he went out, balled out. And everyone like rushed to sell high, and then you basically sold off on a one thousand yard rusher. And I think that's what we can kind of see from James Robinson. Someone just tweeted, uh, "I thought Philip Lindsay was kneeling for the anthem, but he's just that. He's just so short." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "That's so fucking disrespectful." I'm so like, good. multiple levels. Yeah, <laughs> like you're just hitting ricochet shots on everybody. <laughs> it's fucked up. Phil Philip Lindsay's life matters. All right, motherfucker. <laughs> Um, all right, that, that was a, a pretty good week one recap, I feel like. Is there any, like, I guess, uh, lower-named guys for dynasty purposes that kind of caught your Mooney. eye that you think? Yeah. Darnell Mooney. Talk about him because I actually did not look into him, but I kept seeing his name fucking pop up on the box score. Yeah. Darnell Mooney is actually my one of my highest 
uh, exposure wide receivers in Dynasty right now just because he was free. And, you know, he's someone, if you go over to player profiler, he's got like a 90th percentile uh, breakout age because he broke out the age of like 18, 18.9 or something, or 19.2 or something like that. 18.9, yeah, 92nd yeah. percentile. Yeah, he, and he runs like a he runs a four four, so he's like he's a speedster, and we kind of we've kind of seen in that offense right there, they need that guy right, like Taylor Taylor Gabriel kind of served that role uh, back in the day, so you kind of see Darnell Mooney. I mean, he put up a pretty good stat line for an opening like undrafted free agent guy. He's immediately on the field, he's playing, uh, which is important. He's getting the snaps, so I think he's a pretty worthy dart to to just have on the on the end of your roster because on the off chance that Trubisky is good. I mean, he's not, but on the off chance that he is, like you might be looking at a couple of like nice flex buy week fill-ins. And when you're buying stuff off the waiver wire for Dynasty, that's that's honestly like, you know, a pretty good good outcome if you can get a couple starts out of a guy. Yeah, yeah. I talked about uh, this, this kid Quintus Cephas yeah, out Quintus in Detroit Cephas. too. Ten targets, played all, all, all on the outside. So yep. he could be completely back to the bench once Kenny Galladay's back there because Danny Amendola seems like he's got the slot thing pumped up. But like, there's not many guys that you're going to find that get 10 targets sitting on your dynasty waiver wire. Mm -hmm. And those guys come in the beginning weeks, right? So you have to throw as many darts as you can in weeks like one, two, and three, because maybe one or two of them stick. But like, you don't typically find those guys at the end of the year. Like maybe every once in a while, you'll get kind of lucky on a guy like Russell Gage who pops out in like week 13 or some shit that you're not really excited about. But this is the time where we don't know. Like we didn't have preseasons. So this year in particular is like even bigger for knowing roles and, and knowing depth charts and uh, how people are going to be using their offense and stuff. So this is when you use most of your fab, I think, in Dynasty on these yep. uh, up and coming guys that are that are young and that we are kind of, you know, up in air, up in flux with uh, their roles. Yeah, Quintus Cephas is like the properly priced Kelvin Harmon. Like he had a terrible <laughs> yeah. combine. He was good in college. Jeff Okuda said like he was his toughest cover all season, even though he limited to like 13 yards in that one game against them. Now they're he had an Odell. Against. He had an Odell game. It was 10 targets. It was brutal to watch. Like 10 targets, three. He only caught like three of them. Couldn't really get any separation. But like you see 10 targets and you're like, you know, <laughs> targets. You know what I mean? Like that's all you need to see. <laughs> yeah, I think in both situations though, like probably the third or fourth receiver in Detroit and like the third receiver in Chicago, like. Obviously, those aren't sexy pickups, but when you look at your waiver wire in Dynasty Leagues and, like, Chris Hogan staring you in the face as the number one guy, like, I'd much rather take a shot on either yeah. one of these guys on the off chance that somebody on the team either gets moved or injured and they get to play and uh, find their way on the field like Cephas did. Yeah, the key is in, in, in Dynasty, you don't want to roster uh, guys like Danny Amendola unless you really, really – you're, like, struggling for depth. Like, because those guys, the chance of them increasing in value is literally like zero, right? Because they're going to give you like one or two weeks. Nobody pays for that anyways. So you want to like take more shots on stashing some of these like young guys just in case they do like work themselves into a role. Um, did you guys see like Gabriel Davis? Uh, like he's someone that I've been stashing on the, on the Buffalo Bills. He's at like some pretty good training camp. Um, but I didn't, I didn't actually watch that game because because Josh Allen fucking stinks. So he was on the field. He didn't really like do much though. I don't okay. think. I think he caught like two balls for fifteen or sixteen yards. But okay. I, I felt like I kept saying his name kind of pop up in the box room. I have him on a couple of taxi squads too. Yeah. Um, but I didn't see much. One other name I think to throw out there for dynasty leagues that was probably dropped in most most places is uh is Josh Adams for the yeah. New York Jets because Le'Veon Bell pulled a hamstring mm -hmm. and then Frank Orr and Josh Adams split carries. It was like six to six. I think they both saw a couple targets josh adams had like a quick little like fiery stint back in philly two years ago i believe it was where he had like four or five straight games of 20 touches and he looked pretty good um and then he tore his acl so this will be two years removed from the acl and i want to I'll, I'll bring up his profile real quick but i want to say he's still like relatively young and if bell's out for a couple of weeks i mean again like you're not really going to find running back guys on the waiver wire but he's 23 years old and uh, his his athletics are, like, not bad. And he's someone that could, you know, end up putting up 12 to 15 touches for the next three weeks if Le'Veon Bell is out. So I just kind of want to throw that name out there if you're really hurting for running back depth. Yeah. yeah I also think maybe uh, Logan Thomas, too, because he wasn't somebody yeah, that was going to oh, a bunch of hype. Great call. Yeah. He's a little yeah, bit older, say, so I don't think anybody has him. But, like, he's an athletic freak. He had eight targets, like a 26% target share. And as you were saying earlier, Mike, like, snaps aren't everything. Like, routes run. And I'm pretty sure he ran, like, 80% of the offensive yeah. uh, routes on the yeah. offense. Yeah. So. He was, even he was up there in all of them. Yeah, I, I grabbed him in our in the inaugural uh, Big Dogs Dynasty League, like right before the season kicked off. Yeah, I got him in the Scott Fishbowl too. But I've got like uh, actually, I have Kittle, so he's probably a good feeling for that kind of work. Yeah, yeah Logan Thomas. I just he got so much buzz in Redskins camp, and they were like, "Yeah, he won the starting role like flat out." And there's no one else to pass to besides him and Terry. So I mean, I mean this, he, this is like Darren Waller like all over again. You know, you know what I mean? And he's kind of like that same prototypical build. I would say I was gonna say like you know if we want to cover a couple of trade targets like. 
you know, I would I would try and acquire a Logan Thomas, uh, especially in uh, tight end premium leagues. Uh, you're, you're kind of starving at that position. Um, we're like, you know, try and acquire him from people that think it is like a one-time fluke. And, he, you know, he might very well be a one-time fluke, but in terms of like usage. I was going like, to say, usage, you, could, you could acquire him from me. Like I, I would I would ship him <laughs> off right now. To be honest. But I, I'm glad I picked him up, but I would be yeah. more than willing to. So just to say, like throw out some trade targets because I'm yeah. sure people would be willing to give him away. Yeah, exactly. So that that's one. What, what do you guys think uh, about uh, Terry McLaurin? Like, are you are you worried? Are you concerned at all um, by by what happened? Like, honestly, I faded him in DFS because like I I didn't really want any part of Darius Slay against uh, against Terry McLaurin, even though like they're both great players. There's so just like no reason to have him. But I'm I'm not worried because he was a route participant in all of the dropbacks and he took no time off. So the opportunity is going to come for him. And honestly, Haskins looked looked not bad, not bad. So. Uh, I'm still I'm still in on the terminal corn trim. I don't know. I want to hear from from the from his number one uh, number one fan. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not too worried about. it. I mean, five for seventy is fine. He had I think like seven or eight targets, uh, so the participation was there. And this is another game where like. I don't expect one of the reasons you love Terry McLaurin for this year in particular was because it's the Redskins and they're probably going to trail so heavily, but that wasn't the case against Philly. Um, I I think we're going to see a lot more game scripts that are favorable to Terry. And it wasn't like he came out and put up, uh, there were a couple of big wide receivers this week. I can't really think off the top of my head, but I know people were yelling at me like all fucking weekend that didn't have big games uh, that were much higher picks than Terry, like five or 70 is nothing that like, you know, didn't lose you your week. And I think that's like a nice solid wide receiver one outage for the Redskins right now. And he'll have his blow up games. Like they did target him deep a few times that they missed on. And those, those things will come. And there's just still no target competition between him and Logan. So one game of five or 70 week one is not going to be um, too dismantling for me. And like you said, Darius Slay was all over him pretty much all game. Yeah. You got to be like pretty spoiled to be upset with five for 70 against Darius Slay. Like looking at his upcoming <laughs> matchups, the Cardinals, the Browns, the Giants, the Giants again, the Lions, the Bengals. Like, he's going to have a bunch of blow-up games. And we saw last year even being shadowed by Stephon Gilmore. He was, like, the first player in three years to put, like, 50 yards when being shadowed by him. So, we know he can do it when he's being shadowed by good players, as we saw with Darius Slay this past week. Like, although it wasn't otherworldly, like, he still produced decently enough for you that if you put him in your flex, you weren't completely pissed off unless you followed Nick and you drafted him in the third round. But I'm not worried about him at all because – this is a team that isn't going to be winning games 27-17 every other week. Maybe they do want to kill clock with their defense, but I just think that that's probably not going to hold up all season, especially with Dwayne Haskins under center. He's probably going to turn the ball over a little bit, create short yards for other offenses, and they're going to be playing from behind a lot. So I do think that it's his his arrow is pointing up going forward. I don't think we should just expect like 50 to 60 yards every game out of McLaurin because we saw him as a rookie uh, outperform that basically every single week. Yep. All right. Uh, that's all we have for you this week. Make sure you tune in for the narrative. Make sure you check out uh, the, the videos coming out at the end of the week. And then we'll be back you again with the full new slate of videos. Talk more shit about fantasy football. We'll be into week two. Who knows what's going to happen in week two, man? I, I don't know. Like, do you know? Uh, nobody knows. So I don't know. know shit. David know Johnson's going to officially kill me. <laughs> <laughs> nah, David Johnson's going to bust. Baltimore, he's going to get eaten alive. <laughs> that on all right. It. That's all, boys. Make sure you follow us. Make sure you engage. Drop some comments. Drop some subscribe. Make sure you hop over to our Bunk Bed Breakdowns channel and subscribe there as well, um, as well as the main channel. And, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Later. Later.